and welcome everyone. Welcome back to the IMAS podcast where I spelled like AI because we're talking about AI. We're taking a positive approach on what people are doing with AI and also taking out the jargon from the conversation so that we can understand it easier and see how we can use AI. I'm your host, Andrea Ocarina Perez. Thank you for being here. So I want to thank everyone that's been supporting. I have a few members on Buy Me A Coffee, which I really appreciate. And those of you that know me personally know that I don't really update my life on social media, people on my life on social media. And so I have been updating people that have been become members on Buy Me A Coffee and letting them know what I'm up to. And as you can tell, I have a new background behind me. I have moved. So there's lots lots of things to update people about and thank you for your patience that i waited two weeks to release a new episode and also yes thank you for everyone that has shared and liked and subscribed and i've gotten voice notes from people being really excited and telling me like what they thought about episode one and i really really appreciate that because it gives me the drive to keep going and to keep doing this and it makes me honestly really excited and um, I have several people lined up to do an episode, so there's a lot more coming and I'm really excited. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting. Um, the links to Buy Me A Coffee will be in the show notes, whether you're listening to this um, as a podcast or watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description below. So I'm doing things a little differently in this episode and probably the episodes from now on, I'm going to be adding asides in places where I want to explain a technical thing, because again, I want this to be really accessible for everyone. Um, So you're going to hear me jump in or see me jump in if you're watching this on YouTube and explain what exactly that term was or that sentence, if it's maybe unclear or if it's really technical or just technical in general, because again, this is for everybody, not just technical people. Now to introduce you to our guest today. Um, This is someone that I worked with digitally, online, remotely back in 2018, so a long time ago now, Um, and we've kept in touch since, and I noticed in the beginning of the year that they started to play around with AI, and they had their own hashtag, which we'll talk about later, where they have been learning how to use AI and how to implement it and what's going on with it, and so they had on their LinkedIn, they had AI enthusiasts. And I was like, this is perfect. I know this person and I really love their story. And so I want to interview them. And I reached out and they said, definitely, which is so great. So they have been a content, content strategist for several years now. And they actually started a new role, which we'll talk about on in the episode. But everyone, please welcome AI director, Jules Costa. Hello there. Can I have you say your full name and your pronouns, please? Yeah, absolutely. I am Jules Costa. I go by they, them. And I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's not what you asked, but there's that information. (laughs) That's great. That's great to know. So, Jules, I know that you have been a content content strategist for several years now and your job's a, your job title's a little different now but so what are you currently working on yeah i just started a new role so i just started this role as a director of ai content that's the official role and i'm doing that at an it services company called reliable group okay that's really cool and what exactly what 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 does your job entail? What do you have to do? Yeah. So even though Reliable Group has been around for 50 years, they haven't put too much thought into like their marketing or their content or their branding yet. And so I am kind of one of the first hires in that realm. And I'm building a team and will take care of everything from just the very initial like like brand guidelines, tone and voice, all the way through to more sophisticated content experiences that kind of touch everything from marketing to sales and beyond. Okay, cool. And how is 
AI a part of that? Like in this new role, what exactly do you have to focus on? Yeah, so I specifically chose to hop on board here because AI is a central part of the role. Like my my title is literally director of AI content. Yeah. And so AI touches everything we do. And, you know, I'm still in my first month, but the oh, yeah. idea is, yeah, the idea is that we're creating processes that use AI as a partner. So the same way that, you know, you, you would maybe join a company and you would have, you know, a, a copywriter and a designer or, you know, a, a content strategist and, you know, copywriter is the one that comes to mind the most, but, you know, you would have two people working on content together. Mm -hmm. The idea is that we're going to have a smaller human team and we're going to enable our human team with AI partners. So okay. uh, every step of the way, we're either trying to automate through AI or basically enhance human talent using AI. So that can be anything from, for example, using a GPT plugin to read a report, right? And, or, or read an Excel sheet and create a report out of it. Um, mm -hmm. To, of course, using, you know, chat GPT, just like in our average writing, using Koala AI to generate blog posts, et cetera. Now, in this episode, Jules mentions uh, several different tools that they use throughout their work and how they're using it. And so what I have, what I did with episode one and while, what I will continue to do is I will link, I will link those tools in the Discord community. So if you want to see what tools that they're talking about um, and just get a quick link straight to them, you can join the Discord community and I will post them right after I post the episode um, so that you can have access to those very easily. I hope that helps. We're really trying to find the gaps in our process to see where can we make this smoother, better, or faster using AI. That's amazing. So you said you have a smaller team and it sounds like you are, you create a lot of content and you provide a lot of services. So how, how big is, is your team? Yeah. So right now there's only three of us that'll go up to four by the end of the year. So it's, it's a fairly small team that mm -hmm. consists of a researcher, a growth marketer, a content creator, and then me. And the, again, the idea is that even though we are a small team, that we'll be able to, you know, function in a very agile way using AI as a partner. Yeah, that's amazing. Hey, everyone. For those of you watching on YouTube, you notice my hair is different because I almost forgot to record this, this aside. Um, but here I am. I'm glad I remembered. Same day. So here I am. My hair is just different. But... Um, after I had the conversation with Jules, I was really thinking about what they had said about having a smaller team do most of the work. And I knew that that would kind of bring out some fear in people and what that means for the future of jobs now that AI is out there. So I asked Jules a couple questions um, to see their thoughts on what people can do and ask for advice. So I asked two different questions. The first question I asked is, can you give me your thoughts and feelings about the future of content creation now that you're seeing that such a small team can accomplish so much? And this is what they've said. I think the expectations will be higher. We're not quite there yet, but I, su I suspect that eventually the right prompts will provide creators with videos, images, voiceovers, basically anything you can imagine. So it won't be enough to just be a writer. There will be the expectation that you can go above and beyond to create multiple experiences using AI. This means that strategy and creative vision will be key. The core question becomes, how can I create a cohesive brand using AI? They continue with Curious Refuge is doing a great job at this already. The tools used aren't super democratized yet, but again, I suspect it will all become easier in a few years. And then they link to Curious Refuge 
which again, I will put in the Discord channel for everyone to find. Um, and then the second question that I asked was, what advice can you give to other content creators out there that are afraid of AI? So this is what Jules said. Your favorite creators are already using it. I attended a panel a few months ago, they say, and someone with a large following who had worked with other brands like Apple, Nike, et cetera, was talking about their frustrations with AI and then admitted that they were using it to speed up parts of their creative process. People think AI only creates noise and that it's a lazy way to make content, but that's that's like saying taking a photograph is a lazy is lazy compared to painting by hand. Okay, sure, it's usually faster to snap a photo than to paint, but it takes technique, creativity, knowledge, etc., to use a camera effectively. There is a huge difference between an amateur photographer and a professional. Brand still matters. Experience still matters. It's just a question of how to use AI as a sophisticated tool. Again, I will link Curious Refuge uh, link that Jules sent me in the Discord page, and you can find it there. So you said that you just started this role about a month ago, but I've been watching you on LinkedIn, and I know that you've been playing with AI since at least the start of the year. So can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I've actually been with this company for a little longer than <laughs> than I'm like stating. I've, I've been with the company for since the beginning of the year, so about six or seven months now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I joined originally as a community manager. And basically what we've been doing is setting up weekly calls with AI experts to kind of share with business owners and specifically business owners in YPO share how AI can be used and like perhaps like will be used in the future. And so that's where my journey with AI really started. And okay. that's when I started playing around with, okay, you know, I'm a con I've been a content strategist for many, many years now. I've been in UX for many years. Okay, so for those of you outside of the tech world, UX stands for user experience, and it's about making things easy and enjoyable for people when they use websites, apps, or products. UX designers make sure everything works well, looks good, and is easy to use. It's like making sure you have a great time using something. So I always talk about this if I'm like walking in a park, and um, if you ever see a patch of grass you can obviously tell that people have been using to walk through to get from one place to another even though there might be a path set up to get to that space but it wasn't the best path set up so the people created their own path through the grass i'm always like oh the user experience was off here because the users the people walking through the park decided this route is better for, to get from here to there so this is my, this is, I'm going to set up a better user experience for myself. Obviously you can't really do that on the internet on websites because you don't have control over the websites, but that's, I think about user experience at the park often when I see different, like a path that was created by the people walking through the park in the grass. UX is very procedural and it's very iterative. And so I started to kind of question how can I use these tools to kind of help my iteration and help my processes move along. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was also very curious, not just about what AI could do, but also like what it even was, right? <laughs> because I think yeah. we're, saying, we're saying like AI, 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 and people are using this really broad terminology, but there's so much that goes into it. And what we're really talking about right now is mostly LLMs, right? It's it's large language models, like specifically the interface of how humans interact with computers via chat. So Jules mentioned LLM. What LLM means is a large language model, okay? So what I did is I went over to chat GPT and I said, explain to me what a large language model is. They gave me a few paragraphs to explain it, and I'm going to read it for us now. Imagine you have a super smart friend who knows a lot about everything, animals, plants, math, stories, and even jokes. A large language model is like having that super smart friend, 
but it's not a real person. It's a special computer program designed to understand and generate human language. A large language model is created by using a huge amount of text from books, articles, websites, and other sources. It reads and learns from all that text, just like how you would learn from your teachers, parents, and books. Once the large language model learns from all that text, it becomes really good at understanding what other what people say and write or write and can even answer questions, have conversations and write stories just like your super smart friend. The best part is that the more the language model learns, the smarter it becomes and it can help people with lots of things like answering questions, giving advice or being creative and making up new stories. This large language model you're talking to right now is called ChatGPT, and it's one of the smartest ones out there. Humble much. <laughs> it's like having a, an intelligent friend that can talk to, that can talk whenever you need help and just when you don't want to have a fun chat. So again, that is what an LLM is, a large language model. Right? Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of what people mean right now when they say AI, but mm -hmm. uh, it's so much broader than that and bigger than that. And I was really curious about digging into like what's kind of under the hood, like what, when we're saying AI and when we're generating this text, like what, what's actually happening and can we trust it? How, like, how do we know we can trust it and what can we use it for? That's really cool. So when you were a community manager, were you manage like was the community these experts that you spoke to every month yeah so the community was more business owners that had reached like a certain caliber in their business and were like curious about how to move forward knowing that ai was going to be a disruptive technology so i was more managing like the community the business owner community and then we mm -hmm. would every week well we still do it actually so but every week we have an AI expert come in and kind of start a discussion topic. That's amazing. Okay. I really like that. I enjoy that. So what have, what can I ask you, what have been some of your favorite things that you've run into, like tools that you've run into with AI on your, on your journey to learn about it? Yeah. So I don't think that I have any specific tools necessarily that I think are, are interesting, but rather how these tools are used. So, and how we can use things like Zapier, for example, to automate a lot of our work. Um, so if you don't have like a, a GPT API key, get one, <laughs> like that's my advice for everyone because it unlocks a lot of different like integrations and APIs that you can use mostly GPT now for. And I think that that to me is the most interesting use case is not only like, how can we go to these tools? Cause it, right now we're doing a lot of going to the tools, right? You like go on your browser and you look up chat GPT and you type stuff into chat GPT. But I think the more interesting use case is how do we integrate this into Google Sheets? How do we integrate this into mm -hmm. a doc? How do we integrate this into Slack? So that when you perform an action, there's already automated steps that are occurring in order to give you a final result that's maybe a little more sophisticated than you would be able to remember to do by yourself, right? I guess another like tool I would recommend, for example, is like read AI, which is one of those tools that like, it's like Otter AI or those other ones that like go into your zoom and like, you know, record the, the meeting and like takes meeting notes for you, but it does everything like okay. automatically. So all you have to do is set up the meeting and then it already generates those notes. It already generates a summary and you can go to it and manipulate that content and use it you know, in ways that maybe you wouldn't remember to do if you were just the person taking notes. Okay. So yeah. That's, that's what I'm, I'm like most curious about is like, how can we create these kind of custom solutions using these integrations? For sure. That sounds amazing. You mentioned a key. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So GPT, like API key, it's a free key. You, you go to your like GPT account. I think you click on like your 
user profile and then there should be like API keys is like one of the, it's like under mm-hmm. setting um, and you click it and you generate it. And then what that allows you to do is if you, for example, download, like there's, there's like a, a Google spreadsheet, like a Google sheets integration. Mm-hmm. If you have the API key, you can use that integration. And so you can then use GPT like on your spreadsheet rather than like trying to copy and paste a bunch of information into chat GPT. Yeah. It, you just like automatically integrate the okay. AI into your actual sheet. So it's, yeah, I can't explain what exactly it is, but it's basically it's a, it's your digital yeah. key. It's like your specific code. And mm-hmm. then it allows you to create those links between, between your different tools that you're using. Hi, I'm back. So I asked uh, ChatGPT to tell me what an API, API key is in more detail, but I also asked it to explain it to me like I was a child. So this is what it says. Imagine you have a magical key that lets you open a secret door to a special place. The special place has all the toys and games you love to play with. That magical key is like an API key. Now let's talk about the internet, which is like a huge playground with lots of different places to visit and play. Some places on the internet have fun things you can use, like games or pictures. But to get those into those fun places and use their toys, you need a special key, just like the magical key we talked about. An API key is like that special key for the internet. It's a secret code that websites and apps give you so you can use their toys and games. With the API key, you can go to places you like and have fun with all the stuff they have there. But remember, just like you wouldn't give your magical key to someone you don't know, you should also keep your API key safe and not share share it with anyone you don't trust. That way you can have lots of fun on the internet with your special key. Okay? So if you do start using your API key, remember it's just for you. Don't share it with anyone you don't know. Right. Okay. That's amazing. So I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know that existed. So I'm really excited. I mean, that's how I created this is to like learn from the people that are using it and then hopefully integrate it into my own life. But that sounds really amazing. That sounds really cool. Okay. So then how have, how has AI made your life easier? Yeah. I'm going to be honest and say, I'm not sure if AI has made my life easier yet. I think that there is potential for it to be easier, but I think that right now I feel even more motivated and even more ambitious about what I can accomplish. Mm. So I don't know. I'm, I'm going to give like random numbers, right? Like this isn't real numbers, but just for the sake of example, if on an average week I thought that I could produce three really solid articles, right? Mm. Like, three really like do really in-depth like research and interviewing and then produce like three really nice blog articles right I think now I would be like okay well like let's push that number right let's let's do five let's do seven like let's try for ten because Mm -hmm. right whereas before I would have to gather all of the information take all of the notes do all of the interviews etc and then also write the whole content piece and then right. edit it, right? Like do all of these steps. Now it's like you and I can have this conversation. If read AI or any of these like meeting AI, I don't even know, tools. Tools. Right? Yeah. Could come in, record it, already have everything that we said written And then I could go to Claude or I could go to ChatGPT or I could go to whatever my favorite tool is. I could input that, those notes in there, say, you know, take the three most interesting things, take, take the three most interesting things, put it into Koala AI, produce an SEO optimized article immediately. Right. And so something that used to take maybe 10 plus hours of work, all of a sudden it's like, okay, I do this conversation, put it into some AI, and then like, maybe I read it and edit it and like add context and things like that. But you're, 
you're saving half your time, maybe, yeah. more, you know, like maybe even you could get it down to three hours if you're good about your process. So I don't think that it's made my life easier in that, you know, I think it would, it would be a lot easier if I was expecting myself to go at the same pace. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that just because of by virtue of my personality, mm -hmm. um, I think that right now I'm kind of in that in between space where I know enough about what I do to do it well. And I know what I want AI to do, but I need to learn more about AI so that I can automate it enough to get it to a point where it's not only producing the same quality of work, but also is more efficient in terms of time. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I feel like we're similar in the sense that like, we always are always looking for a project or learning and doing more and more. So I feel that I get yeah, that. It's, it's so much fun. And I do think that the dream, right? Like the dream is like, sit back, relax, let AI do the work for us. But I think that it's also just fun to like put the puzzle pieces together and figure out mm -hmm. like, okay, like what are the capabilities? What are the limitations? And how do we fit everything together to create even stronger content systems? Right, right. And it's still such in like early stages too. So it's like, there's constantly new tools being like, Maybe. like let out. <laughs> exactly and like and then if you're already like like once you learn one then you're like wait another one just came out let me look at that one and then so yeah i'm sure right now you're very busy that's why i'm kind of excited to just focus on the podcast and, and let people tell me like which ones What's are the best on? ones yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i'm like i'm like oh you're using what <laughs> how can i use it oh, okay thanks <laughs> all right that's amazing so for the last two questions, I always, I start with a little negative. What are your concerns about the future of AI? And then I will, I will go over to your hopes. So let's start out with what are your concerns with around AI and the future of AI? Yeah. I have many concerns. I think that from a content perspective, right? Like it's just the world that I'm in. So I think we're going to have to be very careful about what information we trust. And I think that this is already true. I'm sure that anybody who writes content or researches in any capacity has seen what happens where like one blog article that ranks well on Google says something, right? It says, it, it like quotes a statistic. It's like 27% of people can fly. And, <laughs> and then another blog writer sees that doesn't double check that resource and then is like 27 percent of people can fly and then yeah. all of a sudden that's like on social media on and everyone's <laughs> this. yeah and then you look into it and you're like wait like where did this research come from is it reliable like like where like literally where did this idea come from at all mm -hmm. i think we're gonna have to be super super like even more careful because you know you have ai generated image now and you have AI generated video and those things are going to get a lot better. And so mm -hmm. um, in terms of like what information can we trust and how, how do we measure that? I think that's going to get a little fuzzy for a long time. And I really, I, I'm very glad that I have like a journalist background and I love my, my journo community yeah. because I think that, that being very curious about like, what is the truth and very being very curious about like, validating your own information is going to be core to the future of content. Right. So I think that that's my, probably my main concern. I think another concern that I have is definitely just emotionally, how are we connecting to other people? Mm -hmm. Like, I think from a professional standpoint, I'm a hundred percent in like, I love AI, like, let's go, like, let's automate, let's do as much as we can. From a personal standpoint, I'm a little worried. Like I like I, I watch how other people engage with AI and you know, therapy's expensive in the US. People, you know, there's a whole like loneliness pandemic happening and AI has the potential to do a lot of good and it has the potential to do a lot of harm. And I'm I'm not sure how that's gonna go from a social aspect. 
Can you expand a bit on the use of AI as therapy? Yeah. So I'm by no means like I don't have any kind of background in psychology. Um, This Mm -hmm. is all anecdotal, but, you know, I've seen posts from like real people that I really know being like, oh, like I was so sad about X thing, but I popped that into chat GPT and now I feel like, like I have a solution, right? Or I feel better about this problem. Or people even just saying like, you know, sometimes I spend way too much time, like talk, quote unquote, talking to chat GPT or what, whichever AI tool is their preference. And you have some tools like Pi that are specifically being created to be emotionally resonant, right? And mm-hmm. that to me is, is <laughs> I hesitate a lot with that. I don't know if you saw the EU regulations, but EU regulations like expressly prohibit the development of emotional AI because, you know, like, okay, like maybe adults can tell the difference, but what happens mm-hmm. when, you know, you have kids talking to, you know, kids are already talk to Alexa and Siri as if they're like people. Like, what if we capacitate these like voice, yeah, these like voice recognition tools, right? Like, what if we capacitate them to also be emotionally capable? And then, like, you have children who are growing up with these, like, essentially, like, robot friends. Like, like, yeah. what, like it, it gets into that territory of, like, w- like, what kind of world are we creating? And is that dystopian? Where we want to go? Yeah. yeah, to me, it like, to me, it is. And I understand, yeah. the, you know, some people make the argument of, like, well, like, isn't it better to not feel lonely, right? Isn't it better to use an AI and, and not feel lonely and not feel depressed and not you know, suffer from maybe suicidal ideation or, wor- you know, those like worst things in life. And, and like, isn't it better to do that than, than to just give people no options? And I, I understand that argument, but I'm also like, is there another way? <laughs> is is yeah. there another way? Because it, it, it does scare me. Yeah. So what are your hopes about the future yeah. with AI? I I have a lot of hopes, I think, for AI. I, I, I really do believe in AI as a very powerful tool to facilitate a lot of more positive experiences online. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that even though it does have the potential to, like, you know, people are like, oh, like, what if, like, now there's only going to be terrible blog posts because they're all going to be AI generated yeah. and all of that stuff. But for me, like the capacity of AI to make connections between different pieces of content for it to enable creativity, for it to enable like speed even right of creation mm-hmm. is really fascinating. And I think opens because ta- like time is our most valuable resource, right? And a lot of people just don't have time <laughs> to like do yeah. things that feel fulfilling or or, or mm-hmm. feel like they're moving towards something. And AI just cuts down that time so much that like now, right? Like when I started, when I first started writing, it took me hundreds of hours, right? Of of writing for free, of writing for not a lot of money of Mm. teaching and reading and trying to connect with people online. Like it took me so much time to develop any type of expertise. Now, you know, there's a whole resource. Like I've been learning to code using chat GPT. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not like paying a bunch of money to a university or spending like hours and hours and hours on YouTube, like confused. I'm going to chat GPT and I'm going like, Hey, explain this thing that I don't understand and teach me how to do this. And so it just cuts down the amount of time that it takes for people to learn and subsequently for people to create. And I think that, you know, whether you believe in like the validity of AI generated content or not, I think it does, it, it makes people's lives more fulfilling because they, they can create things that they want to see and they want to do 
without spending a bunch of hours on it. And I think that that's, for me, like, that's the most exciting part, right? Is, oh, I have a, a movie in my brain and I want to get it out into the world. People who wouldn't have had the resources or the time to do that before, yeah. now we're going to start their content and, and their life's work, like, come to life because of these tools. And that's my optimistic take <laughs> on AI. No, and I love it. And I, like, I think that's what motivated me to start this podcast as well is because I was like, wait, people can be using this to like do fun things or even just like make their work life easier. And if you work for yourself, you can cut your hours in half and then live your life and then like do what makes you human and makes you happy. And so, and so that's what motivated me. I was like, people have to know, people have to know. (laughs) So yeah, I, I'm so glad that that's what you mentioned. I, I talked about it a bit on in the first episode, but I just, I want, I want people to see it as a tool to better their life because it, it like either teaches them to do things that they never thought they would be able to do because it's too expensive. Like education's expensive or to just like, like make their, what they're already doing go faster So that they can spend less hours working and then go out and, I don't know, take a dance class or join a multiple hang out with their family. (laughs) Yeah, like literally do anything other than sit at the computer. Right, right, exactly. I think one of the AI experts that I really enjoy and that I follow, he's a professor at Wharton. His name is Ethan Mollick. And he really stresses, like, we have agency when it comes to AI. Like, it doesn't need to be something Mm -hmm. that takes over your job or this big, scary new technology. Like, we can decide what we use it for and why we use it. And so to your point, right, like, people can use it to give themselves more time. People can use it to, to do more creative projects. You know, people can use it to excel in their careers it, like it doesn't really matter what we use it for it just matters that we use it with intention that's the biggest thing i would say yeah. right i love that all right jules so how can people reach out to you if they'd like to or if they want to follow along on your journey yeah how can they find um, you? so i am on linkedin i am jules costa i should be probably the only jules costa it's j-u-l-e-s and then my last name, C-O-S-T-A, and my hashtag on LinkedIn, which I need to start posting to more often, is hashtag Jules Learns AI. And I kind of post my whole journey right from the beginning when I was just first learning about it. And now I'm going to start posting more tangible applications of what I'm doing in my day-to-day work. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'm excited to see it. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us and telling us your journey. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to another episode of I Am Mas. Like I said before, it really means a lot to me. I really appreciate the support. And whether it's just listening and sharing or liking or leaving a review or a post um, in the YouTube channel or also becoming a member in my buy me coffee i'm i read everything that you write to me i try to respond to everything so i really appreciate it i'm actually going to read something that um somebody wrote in for me in buy me a coffee which i thought was so nice Uh, steph said Cheers to a fantastic new endeavor. Excited to see how the conversation unfolds and highlight sides of AI that seem more accessible and life enhancing rather than all out fear inducing. You do you. Yes. Thank you, Steph. That's exactly what my goal is. I want to make this more accessible. I don't want um, this to be a podcast only for techie people that need to understand all their jargon because honestly, I don't understand everything. So Um, We're here to learn, and that's what I want to do, and that's what I want to focus on. Again, this is your host, Andrea Ocarino Perez. Thank you for listening. Bye.